learning in the delayed Doppler domain. Context for my talk today is 6G wireless, and I want to focus on the opportunity it presents to think about fundamentals of wireless communication. When I was working for AT&T in the 1990s, I saw the transition from narrowband TDMA systems like IS-136 to CDMA. And there the opportunity was to think about the power of spreading. And here I'm sort of revealing my age by confessing that I know IS-136. After that, huge demand for high-speed data led to the transition from CDMA to OFDM. And there the opportunity was to think about the benefits of measuring and adapting to instantaneous channel gains. Today, as it becomes more and more difficult to estimate channels, and we start to see Doppler spreads measured in kilohertz, I'd like to suggest that there is again an opportunity to develop new theory. Now, I should say at the very start that this talk is going to be light on mathematics. Those of you who are curious about the mathematics, there's a magazine article which will shortly appear in IEEE bits, uh, where you can find the mathematical details. So in this slide here, I've made a list of channels where the Doppler spread ranges from next to nothing, the terrestrial pedestrian cha channels, to say 300 hertz for terrestrial mobile channels, maybe three kilohertz for millimeter wave mobile channels, seven and a half kilohertz for planes, and maybe 80 kilohertz for random access with satellites. So I want to explore the proposition that the standard model-dependent approach to wireless communication is starting to break down as channels become more complex and Doppler becomes more significant. And I want to ask whether it might be possible to operate model-free, and I'll describe a little bit what I mean by that. Well, model free versus model dependent, it's a very old question. We were asking this question in the 17th century. I mean, we can think of Newton's laws of motion as a model-based approach that builds on understanding at the most fundamental level. So this is like actually measuring a channel. We can think of Kepler's law of planetary motion as a model free approach that uses data to make predictions. Well, what's changed since the 17th century? Well, machine learning has revolutionized image and natural language processing, and data-driven discovery has revolutionized bioinformatics. In fact, machine learning has changed the way that mathematicians think about approximating functions. We used to think in terms of smoothness, how many times can you differentiate a function? Now we think of how well can you approximate a function with a neural network? Now, let's go back to communications. Um, Philip Woodward, shown here in this slide, died in January 2018 at the age of 98. And he was a very distinguished radar engineer, also a virtuoso clockmaker. And in 1953, only five years after Shannon created information theory, he described how to think of radar in information theoretic terms. He suggested that we view the radar scene as an operator parameterized by delay and Doppler. And he suggested that we think of radar waveforms as questions that we ask the operator. And when he was thinking about questions, he defined a good question in terms of lack of ambiguity in the answer. So his objective was prediction or predictability. And what he wanted was questions with good localization in delay and Doppler. So I'm going to follow Woodward and think about channel prediction as a game of 20 questions with a doubly spread channel. And um, this is a picture of the sort of question 
that uh, we're going to use. So here, with representing the doubly spread channel as taps in delay and Doppler. So we're starting with a time signal, X of T. We time delay by path delay tau, frequency shift by a Doppler shift nu, and weight by some time independent amplitude, H of tau V, tau nu. In the slide, the taps represent reflectors and the height of the tap represents power. And we're interested in predicting the action of a doubly spread channel on a waveform. What should the waveform be? What's the right question to ask? What constitutes a good question of our objective is prediction? Well, the green time domain pulse, that's a good question for pure delay channels. But here the return provides no information about Doppler. On the other hand, a frequency domain pulse, a tone, that's a good question for a pure Doppler channel. But the return provides no information about delay. What we're now going to explain is what's a pulse in the delay Doppler domain. We're going to explain how it interpolates between time domain and frequency domain pulses and explain why it's a good question for doubly spread channels. In the slide, it shows a time domain realization of a pulse in the delay Doppler domain. We're gonna call this a pulse zone. And if you were a radar, a radar engineer, and if you were working with phase coded waveforms, you would think that this kind of signal was quite familiar, I think. Now, we have to do a little bit of mathematics. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle implies that it's not possible to simultaneously localize a signal in time and frequency. If we, but we can uh, satisfy the Heisenberg uncertainty principle by starting with a pulse in the delay Doppler domain and extending it quasi periodically. What does that mean? It means that the delay Doppler domain pulse is in fact a configuration of infinitely many pulses which repeat at multiples of the delay period tau p along the delay axis, and at integer multiples of nu p along the Doppler axis. We take the product of tau p and nu p to be one. So tau p is the delay period, nu p is the Doppler period, and the fundamental period is this box of width tau p and height nu p. Now the phase of the pulse changes when the pulse location shifts by an integer multiple of tau p along the delay axis. No change in phase when the pulse location shifts by an integer multiple of nu p along the Doppler axis. And this kind of Delay Doppler domain pulse is a type of signal that behaves as if it was localized in time and frequency. What does a doubly spread channel do to these pulses? It moves them about in the same way that a pure delay channel acts on time domain pulses. For this to be the case, the delay and Doppler spread of the channel needs to be captured inside the fundamental periods. So we're dealing with underspread channels here. So here, we're looking at the time domain realization of a delay Doppler domain pulse. Mathematically, it's given by the inverse time Zach transform. There's an inverse frequency Zach transform and frequency domain pulse zone 
And I'll refer you to the magazine article for details of those. So here we see a delay Doppler domain pulse located at tau zero, nu zero within the fundamental period. Along the delay axis, it's spread over a length one over B. And along the Doppler axis, it's spread over a length one over T. The time domain realization X of T, it's a pulse train of finite duration T with each pulse in the train spread over the time duration one over B. Consecutive pulses are separated by the delay period tau P. And if you move the pulse location, you displace the time domain pulse zone in time. The pulse train is modulated by a sinusoid of frequency nu zero. And if you move the pulse location along the Doppler axis, it'll displace the modulating tone in frequency. So TDM, time division multiplexing, that's a limiting case. As the delay period tau P grows, the time domain pulses located at tau zero plus n times tau P, they move towards plus or minus infinity and only the time domain pulse at tau zero remains. Similarly, frequency domain multiplexing, that's a limiting case too. As the delay period tau P shrinks, only the tone remains. So pulsones parametrized by tau P and nu P, they interpolate between TDM and FDM. And we're going to think about the, the best value of tau P to choose. So the action of a doubly spread wireless channel on the time domain pulse zones is very simple. For example, the effect of a channel path delay is simply to shift the pulse along the delay axis by an amount equal to the path delay. Pulse zones live on the hyperbola tau p nu p equals one, and they're going to be predictive if the fundamental period captures the channel spread. What does that mean? It means that the, the delay domain period tau p is greater than the channel path delay spread, and the Doppler domain period nu p is greater than the channel path Doppler spread. So that's what it means to, to, to capture. When these conditions are satisfied, the dynamics of the wireless channel, they produce replicas that are separated in the way shown in this slide. What does it mean to be predictable? It means that once you know what happens somewhere, you know what happens everywhere. The received power profile is flat. Technically, there's no fading. And the input-output relation is given by a mathematical relationship convolution. It's just as simple as regular convolution. Uh, see the magazine paper for mathematical details. I mean, what we've really engineered is a two-dimensional Gaussian channel. Uh, let me say a little bit about engineering predictability. So here we're transmitting a single delay Doppler domain pulse in the fundamental domain, rectangular to de delay Doppler domain regions containing the received pulses corresponding to the transmitted pulse and quasi-periodic repetitions. They're shown as different colored rectangles. The rectangles have length equal to the delay spread along the delay axis equal to the Doppler spread along the Doppler axis. Because the fundamental period captures the channel spread, 
there's no aliasing. When that's not the case, we get unpredictability. So here, the fundamental period does not capture the channel spread. The Doppler domain period is greater than the channel Doppler spread, but the delay domain period is less than the channel delay spread. So the green rectangle overlaps with the red and yellow rectangle, resulting in delay domain aliasing. So this is a, a summary picture. So just to be concrete, we're going to start with a particular doubly spread channel. So delay spread, two microseconds, Doppler spread, 1700 hertz. And we fix m equals n equals four. So we've got 16 delay Doppler bins. And what we do is we plot the average power of the received discrete delay Doppler domain signal for different values of tau p. And of course, nu p on the hyperbola. And what we see is that as the delay domain period shrinks, we get frequency selectivity in FDM. As the Doppler domain period shrinks, we get time selectivity in TDM. But the important thing is that there's a sweet spot in the middle of the hyperbola where the fundamental period captures the channel spread, there's no fading, the received power profile is flat, like the surface of a crystalline solid, and we call this the crystalline regime. So to summarize, there's no fading, and the input-output relation is predictable. Traffic light slide. Uh, summarizing the advantages of probing and communicating with these delay Doppler domain pulses, these pulse zones in the crystalline regime. Everything is green. I just want to say one word about complexity of signal processing. And the one word is that it's not more complicated than the Fourier transform that you're used to. There are different domains, the time domain, the frequency domain, and this delay Doppler domain, and there are transforms connecting any two of them. And in fact, you can even think of the Fourier transform as a composition of two Zach transforms. But the, the bottom line in this slide is that signal processing is really not more complicated than you used to. Now, some results. So here, we're looking at the impact of fading in the crystalline regime. So we pick a particular channel model, the vehicular A model, uh, Doppler spread 1.63 kilohertz, delay spread of 2.5 microseconds, here, we're going to take M equals 64, N equals 16. So there are M delay bins and N Doppler bins. So we're focusing on the impact of fading. So in this slide, channel estimation is perfect. So we plot performance as a function of the received signal to noise ratio. This is the ratio of the power of the information carrying signal to the power of the additive, additive white Gaussian noise channel in the received time domain signal. We move along the hyperbola, tau p, nu p equals one, by choosing different periods. We see the performance is superior in the crystalline regime. That's the green curve where nu p is 15 kilohertz. We see the performance approaches TDM as the delay period grows, and that performance approaches FDM as the Doppler period grows. So the red curves are TDM and FDM. 
Now, let's think a little bit about predictability. What happens when we don't have access to perfect channel estimation? So here, the idea in the slide is that channels are getting really complicated. And is there an alternative to working really hard to figure out where all the reflectors are? Can we operate model free? What do we mean about the difference between model free and model dependent? Model dependent is where we go after the reflectors, try and figure out what they are. Model free is where we focus on the input output relations. These are given by the twisted convolution uh, relation. So the input-output relations are described by a matrix, and the matrix has symmetries that make it simple to go after directly. Let's see what happens uh, when we do that. So here, we're, first of all, we're going to look at what's lost when it's possible to learn the channel, but we choose to operate model free. So here we made a toy channel, a five path resolvable channel, where the delay and Doppler shifts are integer multiples of the delay domain resolution one over B and the Doppler domain resolution one over T. So M is 64, N is 16, B is 960 kilohertz, T is 1.6 milliseconds, and the Doppler period mu P is 15 kilohertz. So we see that uh, pulsars are able to resolve the channel, and the performance matches that of perfect CSI. That's the two curves at the bottom that coincide. But we also see that despite a high Doppler spread around 4.4 kilohertz, model-free performance is actually quite similar to that achieved with perfect CSI. Well, in this slide, we explore performance when it's not possible to learn the channel. We return to the vehicular A channel model that we use to study the impact of fading. Doppler spread of 1.63 kilohertz, delay spread of 2.5 microseconds, M delay bins, N Doppler bins, with a Doppler period, nu P of 15 kilohertz. So we don't have the fine delay Doppler resolution necessary for accurate channel estimation. And the model dependent approach fails. That's the top blue curve. And you can see it's just flattened out, it's failing. At the bottom, the star curve, that's perfect CSI. The important curve is the curve with the squares just above it. This is in the crystalline regime. And what the squares are showing is that model-free operation is successful and that performance is only slightly worse than performance with perfect CSI. Now, I should say just as an aside that better filters transmit and receive will extend the range of reliable operation. I won't show that. So here, what we're doing is we're pushing the envelope a little bit. So we're exploring performance in the crystalline regime as we traverse the hyperbola, moving towards the corners, which are represented by TDM and FDM. So here, we've um, we fixed the SNR at 16 dB. And so performance is a function of the Doppler spread. So we're going to vary the Doppler period, nu p, 
by taking the number of Doppler bins to be B over nu P and the number of sorry, number of delay bins to be B over nu P, number of Doppler bins N to be T times nu P. When the Doppler spread, which is twice nu max, is bounded away from nu P, performance doesn't degrade as nu max increases. That's what the two bottom curves are showing. However, when the Doppler spread is close to nu p, performance degrades because of Doppler domain aliasing. That's the red curve that's heading upwards from the bottom. Now here, this slide, what I wanted to do was to return to the channels that we listed at the beginning and show that there's a single choice of delay and Doppler period that supports operation in the crystalline regime across these channels. Here we conclude. Bad news and good news. Bad news, it's getting impossible to learn channels. Good news, it's still very possible to learn input-output relations. For zones, they enable model-free operation in the crystalline regime. And this is something that opens the doors to machine learning. What makes this possible? We're actually, in, in a sense, we're using the doubly spread channel against itself. We're using the operators that define doubly spread channels, both to probe the channel and to transmit information. And finally, a word of inspiration from a galaxy far, far away, which is, here's a graph. We show the hyperbola with 2G time domain, frequency domain, 4G, and the suggestion that pulses in the delay Doppler domain, that is to say, pulsones are a perfect choice for 6G. To quote the little green man, live here, you must.